sometimes I like to use this podcast to manipulate my husband into doing things I want him to do. It works really well. So I guess my first question is, (laughs) who needs therapy? So a lot of people would say everyone needs therapy. I don't believe that. But I think that people misunderstand who therapy is for. I think that a lot of times people think that, um, you know, the way that we treat emotional health is different from the way that we treat physical health. So if you're having, let's say, some discomfort in your chest, right, you're probably not going to wait until you have a heart attack to go see a cardiologist. But if someone is feeling like they're having trouble sleeping or they're having trouble in a relationship or maybe they're feeling anxious, they think, oh, it's not really that bad. Like I have a roof over my head and food on the table. So compared to and whatever they compare it to, they think that somehow there's some hierarchy of pain and they don't meet the threshold. So people often don't come to therapy until they're having the equivalent of an emotional heart attack. And the problem with doing that is that, first of all, you've suffered unnecessarily. Sometimes people will suffer for years before they come to therapy. And the other thing is it's harder to treat at that point because instead of kind of coming like preventative medicine, right? Instead of coming when you say, oh, maybe I need some support with this, they come when things have gotten really bad. So when we ask, you know, who is therapy for, I think if you're asking yourself if you should go to therapy, you probably should go to therapy. My problem, and I told you this off air, and I'm just going to be really blunt about it, is that I really value my time. And to to I've tried to do therapy, but I haven't found the right therapist. And so with that, it's it's like I've gone to all these therapists and I've told you know, we've talked and it hasn't worked. I'm going to say three, about three therapists. And so I'm like, oh my God, this is so much time that I've invested and it hasn't been the right fit. So I guess my question is, what can we do before we even start working with the therapist to know that it's maybe going to be a fit? That is such an important question because in fact, the research shows that the most important factor in the success of your therapy is your relationship with your therapist. It's kind of like dating, right? So no two therapists are exactly the same. Right. And so more than the person's training or the modality they're using, like whether they're using like psychoanalytic or cognitive behavioral or whatever they're using, um, more important than the number of years that they've been practicing is the chemistry that you have with your therapist. So the first session, people don't understand that the first session is not like the outcome is either going to be I'm in therapy with this person or I'm just not going to go to therapy. It's really a consultation. It's an opportunity for you. It's like a first date. You know, what was it like to sit in the room with this person? And at the end, I would say, ask yourself two questions. The first one is, did I feel that this person basically got it? Like, did they understand me? And they're not going to understand everything about you from one session. But do you feel like they kind of were on the same wavelength? And the second question, I think this one's the most important is, did they say something or ask something that made me think about something in a new way? Because therapy is not about going in and downloading the problem of the week and then leaving and coming back the next week and downloading the problem of the week again. That's a complete waste of your time. So what should we look for that are red flags where we're like, "Uh, this is this is. uh." Um, I think if your therapist doesn't challenge you to think about something from a new angle. So I I'm a writer as well as a therapist. And I like to say that I'm really more of an editor in the room, meaning that someone comes in with a story. It's a faulty narrative because we're all unreliable narrators. Um, (laughs) We are. And, you know, and it doesn't mean that we're purposely lying. It just don't tell my husband that I am a reliable narrator to my husband. (laughs) Yes. Well, (laughs) so here's the thing. I'm trying to think there's a lot of fault here, Lauren. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So when I see couples, this is a perfect example, right? So when I see couples, they both come in with a story. And it's not that either of their stories is is not true. It's that it's true from your respective perspectives. So each of your stories is absolutely true from your point of view. But the thing is, there's more to the story. It's like if you're writing a story and you're only writing from the protagonist perspective, you don't know what else is going on. So when people come in, I did a TED talk about this, actually, which is about how changing your story can change your life. Yes. And once you start 
looking at who are the major characters, who are the minor characters? Is the protagonist moving forward? Is the protagonist going in circles? Usually when people come to therapy, the protagonist is going in circles. They are not moving forward. They're stuck because they're not seeing something about the story that they need to see. And partly that's their own role in the story. I have a girlfriend like that. She knows who she is if she's listening. And I tell her this. It seems sometimes that she sometimes feels like she's not taking any accountability. Yeah. So how do you show someone who can no, it's take not. accountability? You know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but no, it's, I think the issue, and like this, I think this is a common issue even for ourselves sometimes, it's like for everybody. It's that it's always some external factor. It's never us, right? And it's like, I think that it's more now than ever, like it's constantly looking to externals, like why something happened. It's, it's never looking to, inward and saying, oh, maybe this bad relationship or this bad friendship or this failed business or this is me, right? It's always like there's some other thing that's causing these so things. So how do you yes. how do you make someone see that like sometimes they're the creator of their own destiny? Right. So I would say sometimes it's true. So we have this expression before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes, <laughs> right? So <laughs> because sometimes it is an external thing, but then what is your reaction to the assholes, right? Yeah. Why are you in that relationship? Are you setting boundaries? Um, are you choosing people who are going to disappoint you? Right. All of those things. So there's that. The other thing is that there's a difference between this is why I always tell people, don't talk to your friends about your partner when you're upset with your partner. Yeah, that's great advice. Because there's what what we get from our friends is called idiot compassion. So there's idiot compassion and wise compassion. And I write about this in, in maybe you should talk to someone. Is this a coin you phrased or that you came or that it's a, you, it's, it's a, it's a Buddhist or, oh, concept. Phrase that you coined or is this No, it's a it's a Buddhist okay, concept. Okay. Um and I talk about it in the book because I think it's so important. So idiot compassion is what we do with our friends. So you, your your friend calls you up and they're like, look at what my partner did. Can you believe that? Or look at what my boss did. Did, or look at what my mother did or whatever it is, right? And we're like, yeah, they're terrible. You were right. They were wrong. And then you just get all riled up. That's idiot compassion. But but sometimes what happens is if you listen to your friends enough, you'll hear a pattern. Like they're always complaining about that thing. And they're <laughs> always the victim of that thing. Mm -hmm. So what you get in therapy is you get wise compassion. And in wise compassion, we hold up a mirror to you and we help you to see something about yourself that maybe you haven't been willing or able to see. So when someone comes in and they're like, look at my partner, they're terrible. Look what they did. Our question isn't, you know, we don't say to them, yeah, they're terrible. I can't believe you're in a relationship with them. It's why, why are you in this? What's going on? What's your role in this? What, what are you doing to improve the situation? So I think that that distinction is really important with external versus internal. So it's not that there aren't circumstances out in the world that are difficult. It's what is our role in reacting to those situations? I cannot agree with you more about not talking to friends about par uh, partner problems. I totally agree with that. And it's it, you you are right. There's a pattern. If you look at it, it's always the same kind of thing. Well, you know, in a way, isn't it? <laughs> I always struggle with when people come to us or individually like and start bashing their partner who a lot of the time we're also friends with, right? Like you start, you start getting in these relationships with, as couples where it's like, you're going out with couples. You maybe, maybe that relationship started with one of the individuals, but now it's both of them. And if you have one constantly bashing the other and you're in a friendship with both, it gets really difficult because maybe on one side you're like, okay, you guys shouldn't be together. And you're sitting at a dinner. Like what the hell are we doing here? Or, you you're looking at that individual and saying, OK, well, if it's this bad, why are you why are you still doing this? And it almost puts you in this position where you either have to bash and tear down the relationship or you have to sit, like kind of question your friend and be like, what's going on mentally? Right. That so, you're staying here. Yeah. There's this other phrase we have called help rejecting complainers. So those are the people who are always complaining about their partners, but they don't want to do anything to make it better. Oh, so they my don't gosh. actually want. So if you might, and, and what happens is it's so frustrating for you as the friend because you care about this person and they keep coming to you with this stuff and you'll make a million suggestions to them thinking that's what they want. And they'll be like, yeah, no, that won't work because, yeah, no, I can't do that because, no, that's never going to work. Right. So it's like they don't actually want a solution. Somehow it's serving them to complain and get the attention from you for complaining. Or then you hear really terrible things about the relationship. And then three weeks later, you're sitting at the wedding and you're like, whoa, I was yeah. just, <laughs> I just heard all this bad stuff. And you got to like kind of sit there and clap your hands like you're happy, but you have all this other information. It's like, I'd rather just not know, right? Like, because it's awkward. But that well, is why therapy is so powerful because you're right. It is a wise place to get advice. It's an outside perspective. And it, if you tell a friend, you're going to get all that comes with it. 
therapy helps you to look at you and what you can do in your situations in life, right? So you're not coming there to change another person. You're coming there to say, what can I do to change something in my life? What do I have the power to change? It's a very, I hate to use the word empowering because I think that gets overused so much, but I think what it does is it gives you agency. So a lot of people come to therapy and they think, oh, I'm the victim of all these things in my life. And it's like, yeah, there might be some really bad things going on in your life, but where's your agency to make changes in your life? And that's what it can help you to clarify. Okay, so I'll put myself on the hot seat right now. Let's do a little couples therapy. Oh, God. <laughs> so I thought it was about other people. One of the problems that Michael and I have, and we've talked about this on the podcast, is that when I, he has a little bit, I'm trying to take accountability in this with myself. Let's, so let's, he has a little bit of an issue with his delivery. It's Kurt. Okay, so or, already, already, I just want to say you're already talking about what his issue is. I know, is. that's what I just said, though. That's what I said. I want to take accountability in there. <laughs> yeah, you're not taking accountability But at my all. reaction is maybe that's it's, I'm, I'm emotionally matching the delivery, which is setting it off more, if that makes but sense. But what you're saying is that, if okay, say I do have a poor delivery. I'm receiving the delivery but if you're re- But if you don't have the <laughs> mental state, or if you're not in a clear mental state, Careful. You're rece- and you're rece- <laughs> yeah, you're receiving that in a in a way that's maybe not conducive. So so much of the time what couples do is they tell the other person what they don't want. And what I want you to do, Lauren, is I want you to tell them what you do want. Okay. So tell them what you do want. I would love it if you were a little bit softer on your delivery and you weren't so um, impatient. (laughs) So again, you're telling him what you don't want. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So so, And also, can you tell him why what that does for you. So when you talk to me like this, this makes me more open to hearing you. When you talk to or me- Or whatever it does for you. With more tenderness and compassion and respect for whatever I'm doing, it makes me feel more relaxed and less reactive. Is that good? Yeah. I hear it. Okay. I get it. No, my, my delivery can sometimes be very um, direct and blunt and to the point. I think sometimes I have a difficulty transitioning between, you know, running a business and then going into like it's a and it's a interesting thing because you try to bring compassion to both places. But sometimes when there's a lot going on, you're just trying to, you know, be as direct as possible. That doesn't always work in a relationship. What, why don't you tell, tell tell Lauren what would help you to make that switch? Well, like what what can she do so that you don't feel like, oh, my God, I'm walking on eggshells because she's going to react to me I, right I think now. The, I think the first thing. And, you know, I don't get so personal with with everybody, but obviously with my wife, the advice and the directness is never coming from a place of not trying to be helpful. Right. Like maybe the like it's the delivery is off, but it's only because I care and want what uh, what I perceive to be the best for her, the best solution for whatever we're working on or going through. Men love solutions. But sometimes that the, the delivery is is just like, hey, this is the there's the problem. This is the solution as opposed to the feelings that exist within. Right. So here's the thing. Most of us don't know how to listen. And, <laughs> and, and so when I, was, when I was training, it's really funny, even therapists, when I was training to be a therapist, one of my supervisors said something that I think is so relevant in relationships. She said, you have two ears and one mouth. There's a reason for that ratio, right? So what does it actually mean to listen? We don't actually ask people what they need when they're coming to us. We make assumptions based on what we think we would want. So Lauren comes to you with a problem. You think, oh, I'd want someone to give me a solution to that problem. And Lauren's saying, I want something different. And so it's really important to ask someone when they come to you with something, how can I be helpful to you right now? Um, Sometimes people just want to vent and maybe the next day or a few days later, they want you to brainstorm with them. But in that moment, they're so riled up that they just want to vent. (laughs) Sure. No, that makes sense. And you know, maybe spent- maybe what they want in that moment is they just want a hug. Maybe they just want to say what they want to say, or maybe they really want to say, "How do you feel? Like, how do you think about this? Or what do you think I can do?" Right. But ask them first, because otherwise, you guys are going to what the person who came to you wants to feel understood. I had this couple once, and she said to him, um, "You know, you know what three words would make me feel so loved?" And he said, "I love you." And she said, "No, I understand you." I think at our core, what we want most is to feel understood before anything else can happen. Sure. No, that makes a ton of sense. Um, another, <laughs> another thing I was going to say that I think a lot of women and men have problems with is the listening thing. 
So any other tips that you have for us would be amazing when it comes to listening. Because I think that I think everyone could be a better listener, including myself. But I think especially with men, sometimes women just want them to listen. I would say yes, absolutely. So again, asking what the person needs in that moment and and how you can be helpful to them. Okay. Um, But I also want to see something in the other direction because I think women don't know how to listen to men Hmm. and we don't talk about this enough. So it's a perfect topic. (laughs) (laughs) So when I see when I see couples and let's say it's a heterosexual couple, but it happens in same sex couples, too. um, There's this this issue of, um, you know, women are saying to men, um, I really want you like a woman will say to her husband, like, I really want you to open up to me. I really want you to tell me what's going on. I feel like there's this distance between us. We're kind of disconnected. Can you share what's going on with me? And let's say that he does. And let's say that he tears up. And let's say that he's talking and he starts crying. Inevitably, she will look at me like a deer in headlights. Like, what do I do with this? I want him to open up to me, but I feel really unsafe when he breaks down. Huh. Right. So there's sort of this double standard. And I see it when men come in alone to therapy, which is that a lot of times men will say, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And they literally have not told a soul, even if they're in a great marriage, even if they have close friends and family, they have not told a soul. Women will come in and they'll say, you know, I've never told anyone this before. Except for my mother, my sister, my best friend, right? <laughs> so they've told maybe one, two, three people, whatever. It's, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. So the difference is that we say we want parity when it comes. We want you know this this equality around. We can all be vulnerable. Emotional health is really important for all of us. But we don't give men the space to do that because there's still this huge stigma. If there's stigma for women, it's ten times worse for men. So I would say when men come to women with something, often they don't feel that they can be vulnerable because they're worried about how the person is going to feel about them if they open up. I mean, I, you know, I think what's interesting about doing this show is we kind of get a him and her perspective on these things. And I, and I personally, like, you know, a lot of men that, you know, maybe they'll say something to friends, but they would never say to their wife, right? Because they just don't feel it's a safe space, right? Especially things like in the bedroom or whatever, Mm -hmm. because they feel like if there's any kind of show of weakness, that it's going to diminish the marriage or the way that the woman or, you know, partner looks at them. I I love when you cry, cry all you want. I cut onions, fake cry. I love when you cry in a a sweet way. There's another thing. And like, if we're going into it, I'll get personal here that I think some men, and I'll just generalize men, like I'll, you know, um, I'll do that. um, Struggle with is There's a lot of things that I try to do. Well, I feel I do my best at when it comes to our relationship. Like, you know, I'm obviously very consistent, never stepping out. I try to be a really good dad. Like all of the things she needs, provider, all of these like things that you would hopefully have in a relationship. And then when we get into an argument or a discussion, it's always the little things that I don't do. It's never an acknowledgement of what I do do. And I say that all the time. Like you can listen to somebody tell you all like your delivery's off or this, but there's it's not ever measured against, but there's also 80 other things that you do do. Well, right? that's Does that make what sense? Lori said. She just said that I need to lead with what you're doing right. So the way that I think a lot of men hear this is they're like, if I'm if I'm going to constantly get beat up about the little things I don't do or changing my delivery, there's like, you kind of be like, oh, then I'm going to start slacking on the other stuff because I'm not appreciated in the other areas. I'm not saying I don't feel, I don't, I don't feel that way all the time, but when I hear you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this without acknowledgement of the things that you do or men do do, and I'm just, again, using a heterosexual relationship, that can be frustrating. Right. So in any relationship, there's this thing called the goodwill bank. And that means that you have to deposit enough goodwill into the bank so that when something goes wrong, like there's a withdrawal, that you have enough funds in the bank. So they say that the ratio is five to one, that you need five deposits of goodwill into the goodwill bank before you can take a withdrawal. So if you're constantly coming at your partner with, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you did this wrong, why did you talk to me that way, whatever it is, but there aren't those other five deposits for each of the withdrawals, then you guys are operating on a deficit and it can really bankrupt literally a relationship. Makes a ton of sense. Um, The other thing that people do that you were just talking about was what we call kitchen sink fighting which is that somebody comes to someone with something like, hey, when you talk to me in that tone, it kind of puts me on guard. And also that other time that you did yes. that. And let me talk about the 85 other things that that happened. Right. So that's like I'm going to bring in not just this, but everything in the kitchen sink. 
And what happens is you never talk about the actual thing that the person is coming to you with because you're then it becomes like, and remember that thing last week that happened? And remember that thing three days ago that happened? And then it just becomes every time you start talking about something, you guys go off on these. It's a laundry list. Yeah, And I'll be sexist again and generalize men and say that we are not good multitaskers. And so when somebody brings an issue to me or again, generalizing other men and it's the one issue and then it trails into 18 other issues that weren't there. It's hard to focus on the thing that needs to be solved because now you're like your brain is just there's 80 things that we need to address here. Right. I think it helps for couples to reframe complaints as compliments. And what I mean by that is it's a bid to get closer. So people think, oh, you're coming at me and that means I'm bad in your eyes. I'm bad in some way or I did something bad. And really what the person is saying, I love you and I want to feel more connected to you. And this made me feel disconnected. But we don't hear it that way because, first of all, we don't know how to talk to each other in that way. And we don't and we and we think because of our childhoods, because of earlier experiences, whatever it might be, that when someone comes to us with a complaint that we're in trouble as opposed to, oh, this is a positive thing. This person gives a shit enough to want to make things better. I think when they're not coming to you, that's when you're in trouble. Yeah. And that's a that's a weakness and a thing that I don't do right. I know that where I I assume that whenever I come, it's being received in the way, oh, this guy gives a shit, which is why he's saying it. And that's maybe a mistake I'm making or probably for sure a mistake I'm making. That's a perfect transition to my question about love language. How important is the love languages to tap into what your partner needs in that area? It's so important. Everybody loves and and loves someone and wants to be loved in their own particular way. And that has so much to do with what messages they got about love and what felt loving to them growing up and what didn't feel loving to them growing up. And everybody grew up in their own environments. So God, that is so true about each of the way we want love. That is so true. So it's all has to do with your childhood. (laughs) It has to do with what you've learned about love growing up and, and through your early adulthood and those experiences and just through your life. It's kind of like if everybody came with an owner's manual, like, you know, when you get an appliance or a car or whatever, like there's a manual. It says like, this is how you need to take care of this thing. We don't get that with the other person that we're with. And we just assume that we, they need to be taken care of the way we like to be taken care of. But that's just not true. And that's where couples don't know how to communicate that. They also think that by telepathy, like you're supposed to read the other person's mind. And somehow if the person didn't read your mind on how you like to be loved, that they are mean, uncaring, they, they're, you know, they don't have empathy, um, they don't care about you enough. I hear this all the time, like this is what he did or this is what she did in response to that. And it's like, did you tell them that this is what you were looking for? Well, no, but they should just know if they love me, they should just know. How are they supposed to know? They weren't around for the the first 20, 30, 40 years of your life. How are they supposed to know? So what if you are telling someone, hey, this is my love language. It's really important to me. And they're not listening. How do you is it something is there like a tactic that the other person can do like five minutes a day? They set an alarm in their calendar. I don't know. Is there something little that the other person can do? And I'm not talking about us necessarily. I'm just talking about Mm -hmm. in general. I think this is where boundaries come in. And I want to say that I think boundary, that word boundaries is overused on the internet. I think that people like on Instagram, they feel like everything needs to be a boundary. (laughs) And I feel like people just can't live in that way. (laughs) It's just not realistic. It's like laser tag, you know, that that thing where you're (laughs) like, (laughs) exactly. So it's, 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 so a boundary isn't what the other person needs to do. A boundary is something that you set for yourself. Like, I am telling you that this is important to me, right? And you can take that information and do whatever you're going to do with that information. But I'm going to tell you that if you yell at me, I'm going to end the conversation. And then we'll come back and talk about it when you're calm. So that person still might yell, right? But you get to choose. Am I going to hold my own boundary with myself and say, you know what? This is not a good time to talk, but let's come back later when we have both sort of, you know, in a better place to talk. Um, And so you're holding the boundary. You're not depending on someone else to do the work for you. If someone is yelling at you, Mm -hmm. coworker, doesn't have to be just be in a relationship Mm -hmm. anywhere. What would you say to do? Like what? And you could even do your own personal thing. Mm -hmm. It depends on your relationship with that person. So I would want to set that boundary in a calmer moment. Like if they're yelling for the first time and you've never heard that before because you don't know them well enough yet, it's the first time. 
you can say, you know what, it, it sounds like we should come back and talk about this when we're both in a better space to, to communicate about this, right? Um, and then in a calmer time, before you come back and talk about it, say, hey, I think it would be real, like if it's, if it's a relationship, I think that it would be really better for us if when we have disagreements or when we get upset with each other, that we could find a time when we can, when we can talk when we're calm, because I don't think we'll ever resolve anything like this. And it also, it's hurtful to me when you yell at me. Um, and then, and then they know that's your boundary, right? And so you can, and then you set your boundary and you can say, so if this happens again, if, if, you know, there's yelling again, if I'm yelling, you're yelling, let's make a deal that we're just going to come back and talk at another time. So you shouldn't do what I do and say, I'm going to cut your dick off if you yell at me. (laughs) I'm going to use that boundary. Yeah. I'm going to say, if you come at me again, I'm going to cut your dick off. (laughs) You know, I think you touched on something here and we, and we talk about, there's, it's a theme in this show, which is like self-awareness and getting to know yourself and and, ha- and using tools to get, to get to nurse. I think a lot of times life just kind of sweeps us away, right? You end up in a career you don't really want to be in. You end up in a relationship you don't know how you got into. You end up doing something that you're like, what, what, is this for me? And I think that's an exercise for all of us in self-awareness and getting to know ourselves better. When you're talking to patients, clients, and they come in for the first time and it's this focus on the external, how do you kind of channel that inward and say like, who are you really, what do you really want? You know, those, like getting to know yourself better. Mm-hmm. Well, if they're coming in as a couple, I actually ask them before they come in, each of them individually, I want them to come in with a goal of what they each can do, not the other person, um, a goal for themselves of how they can make the relationship better. So already we're starting off with not how can I change this thing that my partner is doing that I don't like, but what can I do that I know I'm capable of doing to make the relationship better? And I'm going to really work on that in the couples therapy. And then the other person's going to work on their thing in the couples therapy. And I think when you start from that place of we're each taking responsibility for our own stuff, um, couples make so much progress and get so close with each other. It's really, really beautiful to see. I think when someone comes in individually and they have that external orientation, by the way, we all do. Um, in, in maybe you should talk to someone. It's I follow the lives of four patients with me as their therapist, but I'm the fifth patient in the book mm-hmm. and it's me going through my own therapy. And you can see when I first come in, I'm blaming my ex-boyfriend. That's mm-hmm. all I'm doing. The entire beginning of my therapy is like, he's, he's horrible. How could he do this? What's wrong with him? Right. And it turns out I had a role in this too. So I want to say that it's really human to come in and say the problems are out there. But once we start to realize that we have power, that we have agency and we, we have patterns and dynamics that we're not even aware of, and then we can start to change them. That's when real change happens. I also, you know, Lauren was touching on the love languages and an analysis that I've done over the, I mean, we've been together a long time now. Like she said, we both grew up completely differently in the way that I think we were parented. And not that I think we both felt an immense amount of love growing up. But for example, there was not a lot of words of affirmation in my family. My mom's, my grandmother's full Japanese. My mom's half. Like it's very like typical Asian culture. We didn't, I didn't, there was not a lot of words. And I think in her family, there was a lot of words of affirmation. And there wasn't a lot of affection touch in your family. Sure. And so, but, but I always felt love, but in a different way, it was like maybe acts of service or just like, I always knew that they were there if I needed them. There's all that. But then I think with her and tell me if I'm wrong, there was a lot of words of affirmation and affection. So there's this mismatch of two people that were raised differently, both felt love, but both experienced and learned about love in different ways. And so my way of showing love to most people in my life is acts of service. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of her way is words of affirmation, but there's been a disconnect. So a lot of what I've had to struggle with and learn over the years is how to meet her where she is and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's so beautiful about couples is that they learn from each other things that they didn't actually get. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get a lot of words of affirmation or maybe physical affection and you might learn how to give that and get that in a way that you didn't. And it adds to the other ways that you show love and receive love. And Lauren, you can learn from him, oh, I can love in a way with my presence. I can love by giving. I can love by being solid. And he knows that I'm there without my needing to say it, but I'm showing it in a different way. Yeah. And so you grow as individuals you expand the ways in which you love and can be loved. Yeah, that is so true what you just said, though. Well, and I also struggle, you know, this is this again, like if I'm really thinking about it, 
you know, she's really good at giving compliments or words of affirmation, but I only, I honestly don't hear or receive them. Not, I don't disregard them, but it doesn't, it, 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 there's not like a sensory overload where like, that's love to me. I'm like, oh, great, like, great. Okay. Like good. But I don't receive it in a way where it like, maybe she would receive words about I'm that like sense? that meme that's like how much attention do you need and the memes on the floor like dead and, and I'm like all of it <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we do is like we 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 kind of um kill people with with what we need but but like for us it's healthy and for them it's overwhelming yeah, I can see why. Yeah. So so for them, it doesn't feel good at a certain point. <laughs> like like it's, you know, timing and dosage <laughs> is really important. So when are you doing this and what's the dosage? And you guys might have different timing and dosage around these different ways that you like to like love and give addict. love. <laughs> right. But but see, you're you're kind of like pushing your pills on him. Right. Uh, like true. like he doesn't he you know, for him, that's like an overdose. Yeah. yeah it's, like I don't it, it, it almost <laughs> makes me uncomfortable in some ways when I'm getting compliments. Does that make sense? Right. And it feels like you're bludgeoning him with it. Like it doesn't feel warm to him. Like I think a certain amount you like it. Sure. Right. But yeah, it's always, why, yeah. why is it that I it's not that I like compliments um, and and touch from other people. I like it from my partner. Is well, that, of course, do a lot but, of people say that that they like stuff just from their partner. Well, you don't want to be loved I, by. I mean, by. Well, I think everybody, we have a know? unique relationship with with our partners. Yeah. I mean, you know, and and that's why people always say it's so funny in couples therapy. People will say like, I don't, I don't feel this way with anybody but him or her, right, or them, whatever it is, right. I just like, I, I, it doesn't. So it's obviously the problem is that person, it's my partner, because this doesn't happen with anybody else out in the world, and that's because you are not in the same kind of intimate relationship with anyone else in the world, even if your sister is your best friend in the world or you've known your best friend since you were kids or it's your parents or whatever it is, right? It's not the same as being in this intimate romantic relationship. Nothing will bring up childhood um, baggage as much as being in this intimate relationship. And and you can see that with, with Charlotte in the book is one of the people that we follow and she's in her 20s and she keeps dating these, she has like great friendships. She has like all of her relationships, her career is on track. Everything's going well, except for the fact that she keeps choosing these guys who are going to disappoint her. And she doesn't realize that even though they look very different from her parents, that she has radar for people who are going to disappoint her in exactly the same way. Hmm. Why do so many women? I, I it's not just it, women. Not just women. OK. Why do so many people have a picker that's off? Is it all from childhood? It's, it's actually that their picker is on is the problem. The picker's so, on. So we we have to turn choosing, the picker off. Well, well, what they need to do is they need to resolve some of that stuff so that they will pick better and want something different. So the reason that we have radar for people who are very similar to the people who raised us is that there's comfort in the familiar. And there's also this thing called repetition compulsion where we think this time I'm going to win. I didn't win as a child. I always felt neglected. I didn't feel loved, whatever. I didn't feel seen. I didn't feel heard or understood. But this time, I'm going to master that with this person. They're going to give me all the things that my parents didn't give me um, because there's something very similar about them, but we think different. And yet, they're, again, that radar is very accurate. And so with Charlotte in the book, you can see that once she started dealing with her dad and her mom differently, she started picking different kinds of people. What would happen is when, when your picker is off like that, you not only pick people who are not good for you, you don't pick the people who are good for you. So she would go out on dates with guys who were like really good guys for her. Like, and, and, and it wasn't like, oh, they're not attractive or something like that. It wasn't like, oh, he's nice, but not attractive. They were like super attractive, really emotionally available, really on par with her in terms of like, you know, job and all of those things and, and similar values, similar goals in life. And she'd be like, yeah, he's great, but yeah, no chemistry. The reason what we call chemistry is often a repetition of that thing from childhood that mm. feels really familiar. And so it really, that's where when you asked earlier on, like, why do people go to therapy? A lot of times they go to therapy because they can't find the right relationship or they're having, they keep having trouble in their relationships and they don't understand why. And they keep thinking it's the other person. And sometimes it's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. Huh. 
that I feel like a therapist is a perfect person to point that out. I have yes. w- one other question that I'd be remiss not to ask, and it's a theme that comes up again on the show. It's it's confidence and self worth, but I don't think we've channeled it, that conversation towards relationships. I'll give you an example. We have a, a great friend of ours, you know, successful in every kind of measure, good looking, all the all these different things, and for some reason, this individual feels that he is not worthy of certain people that in, you know in the dating pool, right? And I always find that interesting because from an outside perspective, you would look at this person and be like, has everything, right? And and I think that comes down to confidence and self-worth. So when people come in and they're not feeling confident and they don't feel like they have self-worth in the therapy session, like what, where do you typically channel them? That goes back to this idea of the story that they're carrying around inside of them. So when we talk about the unreliable narrator, sometimes people are an unreliable narrator because they are telling themselves a story that someone else told them that was not accurate. And then they internalized that story and they held it. So some stories that people carry around with them are things like, um, I'm not good enough, or I'm unlovable, or I can't trust anyone, or whatever that story is. They don't even realize that they're carrying around those stories. And so what they do in therapy is they get a rewrite. Like, let's look at the accuracy of that story. Let's look at other evidence for maybe why that story is not true. It's kind of like people come to therapy wearing clothes that don't fit anymore, like they're wearing their childhood clothes and they've outgrown them, but they don't realize that they're an adult and they're free and that the story that they're carrying around is actually a prison. Um, when I went to therapy, my my therapist told me, he said to me at one point, because I was, I was in this stuck place, and he said, you know, you remind me of this cartoon and it's of a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out, but on the right and the left, it's open, no bars. Right. So that's that prison that we like, oh, my gosh, I'm stuck in this. I'm stuck in this. But no, actually, you're free. So why don't we walk around the bars? It's because with freedom comes responsibility. Now we can't blame other people for why things are not going well in our lives, that we have to take responsibility for our own lives. And sometimes we're really afraid to do that because we don't know that we're capable of it. We think we're still children, but we're not. We're adults now. What is it like as a therapist with your credentials going to therapy? I mean, that's got to be a trip. Yeah. And and the reason that that I included my own therapy in the book is that I thought it would be almost disingenuous to like be the expert up on high because really maybe you should talk to someone is about our shared humanity. It's not even really about therapy. It's about what happens when human beings um, share the truth of who they are and start to learn how to be kind to themselves, how to treat themselves well, how to relate differently in the world. And so you can see that I do all the things in therapy that that my patients do with me. You know, like I don't see the thing that's clearly right in front of me. I blame something on someone else. Um, I'm afraid to kind of tell the whole truth. So there are some secrets that I'm harboring that I don't tell my therapist till about halfway through the book, right? Um, And and it's, it's this whole thing of like, why are we so afraid of showing who we really are? And I think it's because, um, you know, the irony of that is that I always say to people, you know, people say to me so much of the time, what happens if someone comes to therapy and you don't like them, right? What do you do with them? Um, And I say something that my supervisor said, which is that there's something likable about everyone. It's your job to find it. The only time that I can't find it is when people are hiding from me. Like they're going off on lots of tangents. They don't want to tell me the truth. They don't want to tell me the whole story of what really happened because they're bathed in shame. They have so much shame about who they are, what they've done. And when people really tell me all of it, everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, that's when I feel really connected to them. And I think out in the world, that's true too. That, And I would say, choose your audience for this, right? You're not going to just broadcast this. But I think that when you're in a trusting, intimate relationship, and I, it doesn't even have to be romantic, a friendship too, that when you show the truth of who you are, that relationship is going to get so much closer. You are going to be so much more loved because it's hard to love someone who is kind of like telling you only half of who they are, showing you half of who they are. Uh, I also think why so many people love your book. Your book has like 50,000 five-star reviews on Amazon, which is insane for a book. I think it's because you put yourself in the hot seat to start the book out. I think that's what made you the books like so amazing to me. It was different. 
Well, what's really funny about it is that um, I was supposed to be writing a book about happiness and I couldn't write that book because I felt like, first of all, I feel like happiness as um, the byproduct of living our lives in a way that's meaningful is what we all want. But happiness as the goal in and of itself is kind of a recipe for disaster. And so I felt like it was really empty. And I felt like what I really wanted to do was show people what I get to see every day, which is I get to see these beautiful stories of people taking risks, moving into new places, breaking patterns, changing their lives in these significant ways. And I wanted to show what it's like to be a fly on the wall in the therapy room and to watch that. But I also felt like, you know, I I really wanted to show that I am, you know, a card carrying member of the human race, that I'm no different from anybody else. So when I tried to say, I don't want to write the happiness book, I want to write this book where I bring people into the therapy room and we follow the lives of these patients and me in my therapy, everyone said, oh, no one, no one wants to read about that. No one wants to read about people talking in a room, right? That's and, my favorite and, part. And I said, well, you know, if three people read this, I want to write this book for those three people because I think it will change their lives. And now, you know, over a million people have bought this book. So and, crazy. And I think it's because I was so vulnerable in the book. When I first turned in the book to my publisher, um, they changed their mind about whether three people were going to read this. And they were like, oh, my gosh, I laughed. I cried. I gave it to a million people. And I thought, "Uh oh, maybe I should clean myself up a little bit. Right. Because I was like, I, I thought nobody's going to read this. I can just like let it rip. I don't you know, <laughs> I don't I don't have to like curate myself in any way. Right. Um, but then I didn't edit myself. I didn't curate myself. I just left it the way it was. And I think that's why it resonates with so many people, because I'm not trying to be someone I'm not trying to be like a cleaner version of myself or a healthier version of myself. I'm just being human. And I think it's such a relief for people to read about these stories where they can see their own lives reflected in all of the people that I write about in this book. Narcissistic personality disorder. I feel like everyone feels they have someone in their family who you got to put on stage. What are your thoughts on that? It's all over the internet, all over Instagram right now. Yeah. So We're taking applications for season three of our podcast right now, which is the Dear Therapist podcast, where we do sessions with people. And for some reason right now, almost every application is about a narcissistic person in someone's life. So Guy and I, Guy's my co-host on the podcast, and he's a therapist as well. And we've been talking about this because we feel like on Instagram and just in general, um, it's sort of used very casually, this term narcissist. Like, my partner did this. That person's a narcissist right? All of a sudden they have narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissistic (laughs) personality disorder is a real thing. And it's not just like, oh, they were being selfish in this moment. That doesn't make you a narcissist. It makes you human. And maybe you need some attention called to that. Um, So I think that there are truly people, though, who like John in the book, you know, maybe he had narcissistic personality disorder. I talk about how I didn't want to think about him as a diagnosis. I wanted to think about him as the the unique human being that he is. But many people who have narcissistic personality disorder, even narcissistic tendencies, feel they, they seem like they have this overinflated view of themselves, like they are the center of attention and everything has to be about them. But it's only because of that that tender piece inside where they actually feel incredibly insecure. They feel unlovable. Um, They feel just like nobody can connect with them. And so, and they're very afraid of connection. So what they do is they push you away with their obnoxious personality. Nobody can get close to a narcissist. There's no way you can have a true intimate relationship with a narcissist because there's no room for anybody else in that relationship. But what it is, it's protection. So I always say that people talk to you through their behaviors and the unspeakable is what they're showing you through their behaviors. And I won't spoil what we learn about John. People absolutely hate him at the beginning of the book. And by the end of the book, they want to hug him. They're like, we love him the most of anyone else that we read about in this book. So it shows you that once you see what is driving this protective shield, which is what narcissism is. Um, And once that person recognizes that and they can go underneath that and see that they can be loved, um, it's a game changer for them and for the relationships in their lives. But what if they don't? What if they don't have the capacity to Mm -hmm. acknowledge that they're a narcissist? What how do you handle that? Do you just handle it at a distance? It depends what 
kind of relationship you have with them. So if you're trying to have an intimate relationship with someone yeah. who doesn't realize that maybe they need some therapy. And by the way, narcissists generally don't come to therapy on their own. It's because there's a problem in a relationship. Their partner dragged them to therapy yeah. and said, you know, we're having trouble in the relationship. And then the therapist will see that. And the therapist, what I will often do is I will do some individual sessions. And I'm not going to use that label, by the way. I think it's really damaging. And I think that it really brings people's, you know, puts that wall up even higher, makes them even more defensive. Meaning if somebody comes in and there's an obvious all of a sudden they're labeled as a narcissist. Well, their partner labels them as that. Yes. Okay. I think it's just, not, even if I agree, by the way, I, I, I don't think it's useful. Um, it's not productive. It's it's not, it, well, it's not helpful because I think a diagnosis is a convenient way for clinicians to speak to each other and talk about a set of symptoms. It, it's a shorthand for us. But when someone who's not a therapist is calling someone something else, even if there are elements of that diagnosis in that person's personality, it's really not helpful. It's more about, hey, when this happens, this is what happens to us in the relationship. That's how you talk to your partner. Um, I think that it, it puts you higher up. It creates this power dynamic. Like, I'm the healthy one. You're the one with the problem. And by the way, if you chose that partner, you clearly have some things you need to resolve too. Sure. What can parents do? We have a two-year-old mm -hmm. to raise a really healthy, happy child. I think that the first thing you can do is model being healthy and happy in your own life. Parents nowadays, and I'm a parent too, so I'm guilty of this. Um, I think what they do is they focus so much on, I don't want my child to experience any, any sadness, anxiety. So we kind of pave this road for them that's very smooth so they don't have to struggle with anything. And we give up. We sacrifice so much on behalf of our kids. And partly that's a reaction to an earlier generation that felt like, well, kids are resilient and whatever they experience, they'll be just fine and we don't really have to worry about their emotional health. But there's a balance. It's like the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. And so a lot of times what you see is you see parents talking their kids out of their feelings. So your kid comes to you and is like, I'm really sad. At lunch today, so-and-so sat with so-and-so and it was terrible. And, you know, the kid's crying and it's really sad. And the parent's heart breaks and says, well, I'm going to call the school about that. Or here's what you should say to your friend and here's what you should do and how dare they, right? As opposed to, yeah, that sounds really hard. Can you imagine just saying that to your kid? And you're, they're crying and they're really upset. You will see that what's going to help your kid is that sounds really hard. And and ask them like, well, what do you what do you think happened, or why do you think they did that today? I got so, a lot and, of yeah. And, and and what do you what so do you don't think come you can in do and be it? Mrs. Fix it. I got a lot of yeah. That's really hard in my upbringing. A lot of that. Like I'd come in and be like, this is tough. It's ugly. Like, yeah. And did it, they help you think it through though? Did they help you kind of? You know, I'm very see? grateful for it now because and it's funny. I just did this stress test yesterday where I, they had all hooked up to all these machines and blood and all this stuff, and I and. Apparently now I manage stress very well. And I think it has a lot to do with being in stressful mental environments as a child. You like you have to work through it. Like you realize, OK, like this is the this is the little cage that you put in. You have to you're going to have to go through it. And at the end of it, you're resilient. Right. I think about that a lot with our child. I think both of our parents did an incredible job. And I know my dad's listening. Hi, daddy. Um, at figure giving Michael and I the tools to figure it out. You want something? Go figure it out. It was, it was a theme of our figure childhood. It out. Right. But here's the thing. It's kind of like you don't want to give them something so constrained like a fishbowl, but you don't want to give them something so open like an ocean. You want to give your kids an aquarium. And what I mean by that is you want to be a witness and a guide. And you don't. So in other words, you're not just a witness. That's the ocean. You don't just want to be sort of like the fixer. That's the fishbowl. You want to be a witness and a guide. So instead of doing this thing where maybe your kid comes to you and they say like, um, you know, oh, I'm really sad about this. And the parent like ignores it completely and says, wants to cheer up the kid and like, let's go get frozen yogurt. Let's go to Disneyland. Or the kid is like, I'm really worried about this. And the parent says, oh, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, no, it's going to work out just fine. You're not letting them feel their feelings. You get so activated by their sadness or their anxiety or the fact that they got disappointed, like they didn't get the role in the school play or whatever it is. And then you're like, no, you were the best. You should have gotten it. No, actually, they weren't the best. They didn't get it. <laughs> I remember. Okay. So so you can say to them like, yeah, it's, you know, like, I know you really wanted that. And I know you worked so hard for that. And I know this is really disappointing. And you give them a hug and you sit with them. It's and a you period let them say, after the sentence. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's, and oh, by the way, and stop talking. OK. I remember distinctly, like when I was a, 
younger, I, they had this Pop Warner football when I was a kid, right? And you, but you did it based on kind of like age and weight, right? So it's kind of in a way a little bit. It was more fair, right? Then I got to high school and I was trying to play football, and like all of a sudden you're there with guys that are, you know, triple the size of me. And I, and it, in Pop Warner, I was fine. I was like one of the, you know, star players. But then I got there and it was like a, a real equalizer, right? I wasn't at all, and I actually had to quit because I just wasn't, I, I didn't have enough size to compete. And I remember being so upset about it, just being like, okay, like. I'm going to have to find another avenue, another thing. I actually ended up going into boxing and a few other things, which was better. But like that was a gut-wrenching moment because a lot of parents told their kids like, yeah, you can keep doing it. And I saw a lot of people continue to play and just get creamed because they're, some of the parents had the mentality like, yeah, just stick with it and you'll be fine. And it just wasn't physically possible. Right. And that's where the lessons come in, I think, about resilience. You want kids who, when they're younger have learned that even when I'm sad or I'm anxious or I'm disappointed or something doesn't go my way, that I have a loving presence there, that I can go and talk about it, that my parent can tolerate my sadness, anxiety, disappointment, anger, right? All of those things. And that feelings are like weather systems. They blow in, they blow out. They're not going to be there forever. And I know that I'm not going to die from this feeling that I have right now. And I know that I don't need someone else to fix it because I have the tools in me. And if I don't, I can go talk to someone and run scenarios by them and get some advice if I need it. Yeah, like that movie, Rudy, you know, it's an inspiring movie, but Rudy sucked, but he shouldn't have been on that <laughs> team. Right? Like, he was terrible. Someone I must have missed that flick. Someone should have told him. Like, I didn't hey, see hey, that. Yeah, well, I, I think that that was like a that movie that, kind of, that you watched after you got kicked out no, no, of but football. But he's kind of like this guy and he's this runt, but he, ever, he just keeps trying hard and hard and hard. And like one day he gets to do a play at the end. Of, I think he gets to do a play at the end. Of, but he sucks the whole time. And it's like, you, you resonated could, with Rudy. You could take that <laughs> mental acuity and that mental toughness and put Rudy somewhere else where he could succeed. But like, because people kept saying like, oh, Rudy, you know what I mean? Like, you just, it's a bad lesson, I think. Right. And I, and I think too, like, sometimes we want to protect our kids from those bad lessons. Like if your kid says, I really want to do it anyway, let them do it and fail and learn. Oh, you know what? Maybe I have talents that can be used differently. Sure. Yes. Maria yes. Shriver came on here yesterday and she said kind of similar what you're saying. She said when a kid, she has four children, when when one of them would tell her something after they would tell her, she would say, tell me more. Yes. And I thought that was smart. Yes. That's that's actually in my book. Um, oh, that, yes. Love so, it. So that's that's what I always say to to kids. In fact, I wrote a piece for Maria's um for, for Sunday, Sunday morning. Yes, Wait, I did. Where we talked where about she that. Got yes. that yeah, from. yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Or, or I don't know if that's where she got it, but we are definitely on the same page. So, um, yes, I always say to parents that when your kid is talking to you about something, just all you need to do is say three words and then stop talking. Tell me more. And not just with your kids, with your partner, with someone at work, right? Just those words. And people will tell you and they will and they can't hear themselves think if they don't get to say what they're saying out loud. Sometimes it just, it's almost like you're there, but they're really having, they're really in conversation with themselves. And we don't give ourselves enough space to hear ourselves think without all the noise out there. So we all have this place inside of we know what our true north is, but what happens is all the noise out there drowns it out. And so sometimes people just are talking to you because they need to amplify that voice inside and quiet those outside voices. Let's end this with a manipulation so we can bookend it. <laughs> Next time I'm talking, I would love to hear tell me more. I think you can do it. I mean, I don't know I'll if I say can it hear to much you. more. No, I'm just kidding. You say, all you have to do is <laughs> so wear this has been very productive. Yes, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. productive. Tell me more is all you have to say in our next fight. I have <laughs> one more maybe ignorant, but I think tactical question. Because we've been obviously focused on a lot of couples here and a little bit on the individual. When, when do you think it's appropriate or maybe it doesn't matter for individuals? Like, uh, like you said, a lot of men get introduced to therapy through couples therapy. But do you ever coach those people to, to go individually before they come as a couple? Like, I, I, I wonder, like, if it's, if it's more helpful for somebody to come and speak to someone individually, work on themselves, and then go to couples? Or do you think it's it doesn't matter which way you do it? It, it does matter, and it depends on that couple and where they are in their own development. I will say that some people think that you're going to learn a lot more about yourself in individual therapy. As someone who sees a lot of couples, often you will learn so much more about yourself in couples therapy, because like we were saying earlier, if you come to individual therapy, you're going to tell me your version of mm -hmm. what's going on in your mm -hmm. life. But I get to see an interaction right in front of me. 
few feet in front of me, I am watching the thing and I'm going to see something so different than the story that you would have told me if you came in individually. And I'm going to help you do something different right in the moment, right there. It's not like you're going to have to go home and do it and then try to do it. And maybe you won't do it exactly the right way. We're going to do it right there in the room. And you're both going to have to do something where you're working on yourselves in the presence of the other. There's nothing more intimate or powerful than that. Makes sense. You are a wealth of knowledge. Come back anytime. I feel like there's so many different directions that we could have taken this. And next time you come on, it'll be more niche. Maybe we'll zone in on like family therapy, childhood therapy. But that was so good to have you on. Where can everyone find you? Pimp your book out. Tell us what's next for you. Tell us about your podcast. Great. So, um, yeah, and I'm happy to come back and talk about anything with you guys. Hi. Love your podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so they can get my book. Maybe you should talk to someone wherever they get books. They can get the new workbook that is the companion to Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, the workbook. And they can get that wherever they get books. And that takes you on a step-by-step guide to rewriting your story. They can listen to the Dear Therapist podcast where we do live sessions with people and then we give them a homework assignment at the end and they have one week to, to complete it and let us know how it went. And you can really see how therapy works by listening to that podcast and see Learn something about yourself in the process. They can watch my TED Talk at TED.com. And they can go to my website, which is LoriGottlieb.com. Lori, you're amazing. You guys, I have book clubs on The Skinny Confidential. I have talked about her book on The Skinny Confidential. I Anyone who's a reader should read this book. You will love it. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I am going to go listen to your podcast. Great. Thank Thanks you, so much. Great That's to talk awesome. to you guys.